Hello and welcome to another episode of Hometown's Daily News Show. Uh, I now refer to it as ODNS and I'm probably going to transition over to that for um, titles and stuff like that just to make things a little simpler to see. You might be questioning what all this is about. I'm Mayor Watt. That's my site. I run everything over at hometown.com. What is hometown.com? It's a news aggregator. Runs out, aggregates a bunch of news, puts it into six main categories. Create, news, education, entertainment, social, and technology. Within those, there are about 50 channels, channels that I intend to bring to Twitch. Uh, I'm, I really don't run around and hype this up with people. Um, so it's one of those things where if you are interested in this then tell a friend, follow me here on Twitch. If you extend over to YouTube, there's a YouTube channel as well. Um, you just go to youtube.com slash hometown. It'll take you there. Same thing with, uh, Twitter. I I'm not over at, um, Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, just not, <laughs> I for reasons, I guess. Um, but I am here every day, 6 PM to 7 PM. And I'm trying to grow to another hour with another focused topic, not just general news. Um, it's probably going to be movies or music or, um, something centered around business. I just don't know. And I also play games here periodically. I haven't been doing much, um, publicly since the beginning of this project um but i intend to actually start playing a game here not sure when um but maybe if you are interested then send me a note follow me let me know that you're interested in that kind of thing um and i just dig interaction live interaction so maybe i should start running around saying that i stream everywhere um and um and network and stuff like that but i just don't ask for it and i only ask for it now um this last couple of days i'm just saying hey i need people to come over to twitch and follow me uh, when i'm over on youtube or i'm on twitter um, or in the podcast there's a podcast version of this so if you don't like my face you can listen to the podcast um, but it's an unedited unfiltered version of this uh, so come on over to Twitch, right? Um, and if you're already here watching me, then um, please follow me and let me know that you're interested in this kind of thing. So I go through about 20 articles and I give a little bit of context to it. And um, my perspective on things and I, I'm, I try to elicit a response. If you are lurking, then so be it. That's fine. Um, you are the lifeblood of a channel pretty much, uh, you know, if you're interested in this kind of stuff and you just want to listen, then that's great. Um, but if you want to host or co-host a channel, then you can get in touch with me. You'll be in this box or up there if we're going to co-host it. Uh, that said, let's get into today's set of news. Um, the first article is, pardon me. Um, in the daily news show, that's this show, uh, but it's also a channel at hometown.com uh, under the news category. There's the daily news show. If you're listening to this in the podcast, then you're basically hearing me say the name of articles in a brief description and maybe a couple of quotes and some context. Uh, so you're not seeing the URL. Uh, at any rate, uh, the article's title is More Americans Against uh, Laws That Prohibit L prohibit LGBTQ lessons in grade school. That's a poll. So more Americans against laws that prohibit lessons in grade school about LGBTQ. Um, and it's, it basically says here, this little snippet, which is what my aggregator grabs. It says the poll found stronger support among Republicans. So let's click this link. It takes us over to ABC news. Um, and it has a video. I won't play the video. I, um, actually I'm going to have to pause it. Um, 
And it says more than six in 10 Americans oppose legislation that would prohibit classroom uh, lessons about sexual orientation or gender identity in elementary school. Um, yeah, human beings need to know about the, the human condition, as it were. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not like this is new or unique, right? The, all of this, the, us being a human and the, the fidelity of being a human, right? It's a, a broader gamut than just this or that. It is, um, we are a composite. And so this has been spoken about. This has been in existence since the dawning of mankind. The only thing that has changed is that people are now becoming, um, they're breaking out of their bonds of kind of forced alignment. The only way to exist or be oppressed, sometimes physically oppressed, violently oppressed, um, was to simply go along. Uh, with whatever it was publicly, but privately exist um, in your own skin. And it led to uh, quite a lot of pain and suffering for people. Well, gone are those days. Uh, I blame lead paint um, that people are sociopathic and willing to oppress human beings so that a person fits within their particular stereotyped focus. You have to be uh, male and be male. You have to be female and be female. You have to love pink stuff versus blue stuff. You have to play with dolls versus grabbing a hammer. We aren't like that. We're all human being and it's a spectrum. So people need to deal with it and not be oppressive little Oh, sociopaths. I'll just say that. Um, but this shows that public support is growing. Um, this is an article over at ABC News. Again, it's titled Six in Ten Americans Oppose Laws Prohibiting LGBTQ Lessons in Elementary School. And it's an article written by Meredith DeLiso. Um, and so what happens if you're new to this uh, show? Um, I go through about 20 articles. I give some context. I give my perception of the news. Um, I might, it might provoke a response from you. I'm happy to discuss it here in real time or later, whenever. Um, but just keep a level head. If you get really upset with me about something, I, I, I can't do anything about it. Um, other than try and, you know, state the facts, state my perception of things. Um, and when you get upset about things, uh, it doesn't really solve the problem. It becomes an emotional response um, and not one founded on any sense of logic. Um, and I can't overcome things like an emotional response. I, I can talk to you about it, though. Um, so... If you have questions or comments, throw it in chat, or if you want to, I can throw, uh, I can set up a zoom and I can pull you in video and or audio into this and uh, we can have a chat. Uh, this next article is in the daily news show again. And uh, the title is instead of taxing the poorest, the U S needs a maximum income and the snippet is we need to bend power back toward the people enough with Rick Scott and his minimum income tax. So this is a common dreams.org article. Now I don't necessarily agree with any of these articles, um, premises or their results, the, whatever their perception is, I don't necessarily agree with it. I bring it to the attention of anyone who's watching this or listening um, because this is something that people are talking about, right? So this is a common dreams.org.org article written by Sam Pizzagotti. And uh, I suppose it's by proxy inequality.org is where it's from as well. Um, but this article says, 
Now, Mitch McConnell, the GOP Senate leader, doesn't have a problem with billionaires. He spent his entire political career helping billionaires make more billions. But Mitch McConnell does have a problem with one particular fabulously rich figure. The problem just happens to be with the U.S. Senate's richest senator, Rick Scott of Florida. Um, senator Rick Scott last month released an 11-point plan to rescue America. And um, Sam says that it's a, a manifesto that has exactly 11 points too many for Mitch McConnell. So it says here, instead of taxing the poorest, the U.S. needs a maximum income. Um, but to me, I don't think that that's actually... You're not going to ever be able to implement um, a control like that. What needs to change is that, um, so this is, this goes beyond, <laughs> I'm getting kind of caught up. Um, so there's, there's economics there. Okay. So I, there's economics and there's social. And when the two merge together, you get kind of things like this. Um, now you're never going to implement, be able to implement rationally you would have to be so oppressive to institute a maximum income. Um, it, it, that is irrational in a society. There's always going to be people that are fabulously rich and unfortunately fabulously poor. The problem here is that we have a society that believes that that's okay. Um, and so instead of making it possible that everybody um, sees the need to utilize their wealth to benefit all of society. There's a lot of it that's stored in certain places where entire generations upon generations never need to work because they've generated revenue. And now the revenue, the money that they own, the money that they control is making more money than uh, going to work, right? They'll never need to make more money because the interest on their investments are making money. And then they go and buy another company or invest in another company. And, and again, they make more money. Um, yeah, some people are actually working. They're filthy rich, but they're still working. Um, but there's generational wealth that exists. But we don't have, we have people thinking about, hey, I'm going to donate money, but they're donating money based on their perception of it being valuable, which is great, but it's also lowering their taxable income. So, hey, that's a win. Um, and not simply because it's a good, right? It's a good for all of society. But what I'm talking about is a sociological change where people don't look to grab the brass ring and make $400 million in a year because they're the CEO of a company yet the products or services that they're selling price out everybody except the fabulously wealthy, even though it's not necessarily something that is in and of itself so expensive. Um, I mean, uh, I can't give examples without it getting really kind of close. Um, so it's, it's a matter of perception and I don't think that you'll ever be able to kind of stamp out a maximum income until we all realize, and it has to be pretty much unanimous, um, a social movement, a cause driving us all the reason why things are expensive and right now getting we are suffering from inflation is because there are very few suppliers for many, many goods and they're raising the costs so that they can recoup the last two and a half years or two years of losses due to the pandemic. If you account for the margin, if you absorb it and lower the margin of profitability and, and just deal with it as a society, you wouldn't have inflation, but that's not what's happening. There's a lot of money in the system. The people with the means to produce 
raw materials are raising the cost to get that money. And that means everybody is going to have to pay more. So you have to pull the stakeholder value out of this because stakeholders are saying, well, I need a 6% growth or 12% growth. Otherwise I won't invest in your company. There's so many more things that are involved in this, that it's not as simple as forcing a maximum income. You force a maximum income and you will have riots in the streets because who is it that sets that? What is the amount? What would motivate me other than a social change as to, well, if my income is maximized, I'm only going to do as little as humanly possible to get to that maximum. And then there there people are going to find other ways around it. I mean, they're, <laughs> who knows what's going to, what's actually going to end up. I, you know, I'm not, I'd have to sit there and, and think and, and work with people to, to hash out where some other holes would be. But there are people that just think like this. Let's find a weakness in this policy. Go over to this article at, at Common Dreams and read the rest of it. Um, I mean, they're they're poking at Republicans, but um, there are rich Democrats as well. I mean, the whole spectrum of things of politics. There are there are people that are making money um, that are, are already, you know, from my perspective and many other people's perspective, filthy rich and wouldn't need more money. When you're making $115 million in a year, why do you need more money other than to what? What are you doing with it? Well, nobody knows because it's... <laughs> Go look up insider trading and I'm telling you, abuse happens in the dark. It's just, it's amazing. And, and they're talking about maximum income. Don't try to use the government to do something like this because it takes a societal change, not a political legislative change. You know, raise taxes, introduce policy or procedure where nobody can own, go, go back to the way that it used to be where nobody could own more than a certain number of radio stations, TV stations in a market. Um, there's all kinds of things that used to be in effect, but have been wiped out over the years, neutered, the stock act, for instance, entirely hobbled. I'm more bound by the, the stock act than the, 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 the stock act impacting the people that it's supposed to. Um, but I'm going to have to move on. Otherwise I'm never going to get through this news. And again, it, it's a, a pretty eclectic array of, um, articles. So, um, this next article is in the continuity continuity report channel. Um, it's the boys season four, um, could film by end of 2022. Um, pardon me. Uh, Carl urban says, and it's marked as an exclusive, but this is all over the place. Um, Amazon prime videos, darkly comic superhero hit the boys, uh, only just unveiled at season three, uh, trailer at South by Southwest on Saturday but Variety already has some clarity on uh, when the fourth installment is coming. Um, so it could be done by the end of 2022. Let's click this link. Now, this is an article over at Variety. It's written by Matt Donnelly. Let me pause this. And uh, again, it's the title is uh, The Boys Season 4 Could Film by End of 2022, Starl Carl Urban says. And... Um, it says Carl Urban, who uh, plays Billy Butcher on the series, hinted that the production will rev up in the fourth quarter of 2022. Um, so if you've never seen The Boys, it, it basically is um, a <laughs> it's a show about a commercialized um, set of superheroes and it goes dark immediately and gets darker as time goes on. Um, uh, I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but, um, it's a fun watch, but brace yourself for, Oh, I don't know. Uh, blood and guts kind of thing. 
and uh and <laughs> it it is interesting I, I just i can't i don't want to i want to talk about it but i don't want to spoil it for anybody uh, but they are starting season three and uh, season four here is hinted at when it's going to be uh, started and maybe completed uh, it usually doesn't take too long to get this kind of thing done um, as opposed to what I saw yesterday, which was the Atom Project, which apparently started in 2012 um, with Tom Cruise, which entirely blew me away that uh, where it started and <laughs> where it ended. And if you haven't seen the Atom Project, go and check that out, too. That's on Netflix. Um, this next article I'm going to continue is in the continuity report as well. This is The Lost City. It's a They do a review. Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum are cute together in guilty pleasure treasure movie. So you know the studio movies are in a rut when amid endless uh, spider bat sequels, you find yourself longing for the likes of such escapist 1980s offerings as Romancing the Stone and King Solomon's Mines. I can't be the only one who's been craving a good old-fashioned treasure hunt where the leads throw sparks and uh, my snippet just kind of cuts it off by the way i don't take a lot of the article i don't take the graphics um, i want you to click the link that takes you over to the site and in this case it's over at variety written by peter de bruge and it says flipping the gender rule slightly this romancing the stone redo uh suggests you can have your beefcake and do whatever you want with it and if you can go and go to youtube and look at the trailer for the lost city um it'll give you a really good picture of what it is and it looks like it's a fun watch um at least the perspective that i saw i didn't watch the movie yet um but the the trailer basically makes it pretty innocuous and and a fun watch um where uh, sandra bullock is basically the one sent on a on a trip um, to find the lost city. Um, and again, I don't want to ruin this for anybody. I just want to tease you to go over to watch the trailer. You'll get a good picture of what it is, and then you can come back and talk to me um, tomorrow about it if you are oh so motivated. And if you are listening to this the day after or whenever um, as the podcast gets published or on YouTube, um, uh, come on back and, and have a chat because like I said, I want to launch 50 shows and one of them is about movies and it is the, the channel that this was filed in, which is uh, the continuity report. So let's keep on going. Uh, the next article is in the mobile channel and the key to a $4 billion fraud case is a banker who says he lied a lot. Only one person is likely to, have, this is a, the snippet from the article. Only one person is likely to ever face trial in the United States over the looted billions from a Malaysian sovereign wealth fund. And the case hangs on his former boss at Goldman Sachs. So this is a New York Times article written by Matthew Goldstein. Did I say who that other one? Yeah. Um, and... <clears throat> has a picture of uh, Tim Lesner in the center, a former Goldman Sachs banker leaving the federal court in Brooklyn last month. It's a picture that was taken by Stephanie Keith, I believe, at Bloomberg. Um, you can go over to New York Times and read all of this article, but this is about a $4 billion fraud case. Billion with a B. And it says the case hangs on his former boss at Goldman Sachs. A former banker at Goldman Sachs, Roger Ng, uh, it, the last name is NG, is accused of taking part in a bribery and kickback scheme that enabled the fraud, which plundered more than $4 billion from, uh, sorry, from a Malaysian sovereign wealth fund and bought a king's ransom of jewelry, art, and real estate from Manhattan to London to Beverly Hills. Oh my God, it's amazing. I mean, the amount of, 
the amount of wealth there, right? Wealth with no value. Again, it was bought buying a bunch of stuff. Now I understand the social implications of, you know, uh, giving a ton of money to a whole bunch of people, um, th that the perception is that it gets watered down because so many people are in need. And so it's not really going to help, you know, other than the short term. And there's always talk about, you know, um, yeah, a million dollars donated to X number of people. They'll just spend it or whatever. I mean, for crying out loud, this is just one person, $4 billion from a Malaysian sovereign wealth fund. And they go and enrich themselves buying jewelry, art, and, and not just the ethics. I mean, it, it's just, it's beyond reasoning. Like, how do you rationalize doing something like this? If again, if all of this is, is, um, I mean, it's testimony, so obviously it's happened and obviously it's being prosecuted, but how do people do this? Why, how do they get a, away with it for so long? Um, and why does it take this long to prosecute? You know, I, there are people that are doing just silly crimes perceived crimes right I, I can't get into it you know there are people that are going to jail for much less than this and this person is probably gonna pay a fine and yeah i don't know um we'll see what happens but it says mr leisner's 10 days of testimony including six days of blistering cross-examination laid out the details of a global fraud that toppled Malaysia's prime minister and forced Goldman Sachs, one of the world's most prestigious uh, financial institutions to go before a U.S. judge and admit for the first time in 153 year history that it was guilty of a crime. And it's not the company. It's the people within the company that committed this. You're not going to be able to put Goldman Sachs in jail. You're not going to be able to do anything but find them. Um, and the worst you could probably do would be to hobble them in some way through administrative oversight. But the fine that they get is going to be pennies on the dollar. If that, you know, a fraction of a penny on the dollar for this being perpetrated, not enough oversight. That's exactly what it was. And yet again, another example of abuse happens in the dark. <clears throat> So go over to New York Times and read this article. The key to a $4 billion fraud case is a banker who says he lied a lot. Let's continue on. This next article um, is in the Warcrafters channel. 22 of the rarest and most expensive big box PC games. A box copy of the 1990 Mega Man DOS game, which is... <laughs> Get in the Wayback Machine um, is on sale at on eBay. I haven't clicked any of these links, so I don't know really what all is on here. Um, that actually grabbed quite a bit of the article, um, and uh, I normally don't allow that. It's usually just the first paragraph, um, but it grabbed a few more paragraphs. But it's an article over at PC Gamer, and we'll go here in a second. But um, Retro game collecting has been a big deal for a while now, while the focus has mainly been on old console games. The record for the most expensive game ever sold is a sealed edition of Super Mario Brothers that was auctioned for $2 million last August. <laughs> $2 million for a Super Mario Brothers game. Whereas classic big box PC games have rarely been priced over $1,000 until recently. The PC game collecting is heating up so let's click this link um pc gamer this article is written by ted litchfield and it says more hint books promo cards and folding front flaps than you can shake a pewter figurine at and uh it goes into greater detail uh, there's actually a lot of um uh, games so this actually has 22 um, references to 
um, products that are selling. So like a thousand dollars for what says a cryogenic nightmare, but it says apparently it's suspended that one. Um, and it, it just goes up apparently. I think that this is just a list that's slowly creeping up. Oh, actually they're categorized. So let's see, um, Elder Scrolls three Morrowind. Sorry for the scrolling, by the way, if you're watching this, I am scrolling because this is the first time I've actually seen all of the content. I don't prep for the shows at the same way that somebody might be when they're um, kind of doing a show on a topic. Um, I actually pick a bunch of headlines and then I read them for the first time um, with you. And so I add my context if there is some context. Um, typically somewhere in the categories, there's three main areas that I focus my context on, and that is business, technology, and society. Um, if I don't have much to add, then I basically just highlight the article. Um, but we have seen some things uh, more, I should say, about how the games have kind of just collapsed and been they were junk games or they were thrown in a landfill, um, but never really anybody's done a discussion about the most expensive games, at least nothing that I've read uh, in the last two and a half years. Um, it was news to me that there was a game that was sold for a um, million dollars. So go over to pcgamer.com. Um, I'm really sorry, everybody who might be watching this on video. I'm going to scroll up real fast. I'm saying it while I'm doing it. Anyway, the article is titled 22 of the rarest and most expensive big box PC games. And in this case, if it's a physical product, it is rare. Um, there's a, a lot of things where somebody talks about like a picture being rare and then it's all over the place. Um, because you can make infinite number an infinite number of copies of a picture, um, but a, a console game where it's a physical product, it's becoming few and far between that they exist. Um, everybody's buying stuff that's electronic and um, there's infinite numbers of electronic products. Or, or I should say digital. Electronic has a different context. Um, that said, I'm going to continue on to the next article, and that's in the Mobile channel. Uh, these weed sellers aren't waiting for permits, like a dream come true, in quotes. Here's what it's like to walk through Washington Square Park in Manhattan in the wake of legalization. So if you are, if you find that uh, the sale of marijuana is abhorrent, you're not going to like this article. Um, this is a New York Times article. It's written by David Gonzalez and it has this uh, picture uh, uh, for the cover art of the article of someone who has apparently a table out in a park where they're selling marijuana. Um, all rolled up as joints in jars. Um, and they have these great names like Orange Aid. I don't know what that that one looks like. It says cheese on it, but. Uh, I hope it's not, um, but I've never seen it. So, um, wanting to invest in himself and be free of bosses, Terrence Gorham started selling customized t-shirts, hoodies, and backpacks from a folding table in Washington Square Park a year ago. Like any good vendor, he noticed last year when other tables started featuring something new, weed. Soon he was offering pre-rolled joints and uh, eighth of an ounce patches, pouches alongside his think rich clothing line. And he says, we're chameleons, said Mr. Gorman 34, who once worked as a custodian. We have to adapt any environment. Weed's legal here, so I thought, why not? Yeah. I mean, if it's legal, treat it like cigarettes, tax it. It's healthier than cigarettes in my perception. It's along the lines of drinking a beer. Um, except that you don't hop in a car. And, and again, it might be my perception, it, my interpretation of things, my, uh, you know, my history of experiencing people who are getting drunk or stoned. Um, 
but you don't get in a car and drive recklessly when you're stoned because you think that you are going 75 miles an hour when you're going 7.5 miles an hour again might be a narrow-minded perspe- perception because of my particular uh experience in this space um but you know without a doubt i think it's healthier than cigarettes um at least with with weed you're not inhaling actual tar um but nothing alcohol drugs you know weed is a drug anything that you inhale or drink that stupefies you in some way you know you are literally throwing toxins into your blood and then your body processes it it is what it is Um, but it's more natural and um, there's more context to this than you can possibly imagine Um, historically the source of why this even exists why weed exists and it's not you know for everybody just to hang out and have a good time Um, just like cigarettes it's a spin-off of something like weed but i'm i'm all for legalization every state should have it legalized treat it like beer tax it and um, spend that money on education because educating people not about weed but about everything just flat out educating people is a fundamental cure for a lot of issues in this world Um, anyway so go over to that new york times article titled these weed sellers aren't waiting for permits like a dream come true. The next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Um, that's a channel about that discusses business and intellectual property. Uh, what is causing U.S. utility bills to rise, and will it persist in warmer months? It says here a variety of factors, from Russia's invasion to the pandemic, are causing higher bills, and America should expect to see higher bills until the end of the year. Um, I think that the, those bills will increase and uh, I, I again I will reiterate that I think it's profiteering. Um, I don't think Russia's invasion of Ukraine is impacting pricing at all and I don't think that it will decline much by the end of the year um, even in warmer months. It doesn't matter. It'll it, it'll increase but it will drop a fraction. Of what it increased because businesses will see that people are willing to pay whatever the price to stay comfortable um and if not even comfortable <laughs> um, people will struggle yet still want to uh, how can i put this other than they want to stay alive so they will pay the fees to keep their utility uh, operating that i mean that's about as bluntly as i can put it and they'll do it until they can no longer do it and it will be at their health expense not their they won't have any more money and it's this is a it's a horrible situation and it's all because of the key producers key, uh, key suppliers of goods um a dramatic rise in energy prices in the u.s is causing utility bills to soar with uh, many left wondering what is driving the rise and will it persist through warmer months the the rest of that question doesn't even need to be asked what is driving the rise because this is happening in the dark and nobody can truly trace it all the way back um unless somebody does a deeper dive investigative journalism to the rescue come on um, i won't be able to do it uh, it would be way too obvious that i'm confrontational about my investigation because <laughs> i tend to storm into um, inquiry i expect people to be candid um just like this you know i'm saying exactly what's on my mind um with a, a, a light social filter so that i don't really you know trigger somebody i don't want people just misinterpreting what i'm saying 
Um, that said, let's click this link and go over to The Guardian. This is an article by Alia, I think it's Udiova and Andrew Witherspoon. Um, what is causing utility bills to rise? Uh, it has a neat graphic of a utility station, it looks like. Um, but you'll have to be, you'll have to go over and take a look at it uh, if you're in the listening to the podcast. Um, so it says a variety of factors that range from invasion of Ukraine to the pandemic to climate related events are behind the increase that that's affecting millions of people putting a strain on. Um, see, but they're not talking this, this article again, I, I, go over and read it for yourself, but it's my perception that they're not addressing the issue. It says a variety of factors are putting a strain on it from the pandemic to climate change or climate related events. Um, this is just, these companies are having record profits while prices are rising. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier about it needs to be a fundamental social change in how humans are treating humans all for profit right there are people that are going to end up suffering greater than other people and just because you don't see them doesn't mean that they don't exist but sometimes it's a goofy decision right so at the same time weather related disruptions from the february texas freeze and category four hurricane ida halted oil production in the gulf coast and the supply constraints led to higher prices as the demand increased. There was no demand increase. It's we have a fixed population and I shouldn't say it like that. We don't have a fixed population. We have a fixed population in a given time. It's anticipated that in that populations grow, but the consumption doesn't grow at the same rate. I mean, just because somebody is born doesn't mean that the family suddenly starts using 25% more heating or driving 25% more because they've got a fourth kid. It It's just not logical. Um, yet the prices are skyrocketing, but it's an excuse. It's an excuse. And the excuse is bound by stakeholder valuation. I have to have 12% profit. I have to have 20% growth or even 8% growth. Yet salaries aren't increasing, but profitability is. So what's the disconnect? It's a social disconnect. That's my perception. That's my take on it. Um, but they talk about it here in, in this article, you know, fuel oil is still a major source of home eating in the Northeast, but less so in the rest of the U.S. has been the sharpest increase of 44% compared to a year prior. Its movement as a petroleum product follows similar trends as gasoline, which also dipped in the early pandemic before surging. This right here is the key element. That sentence right there is just reaffirming my claim that this is profiteering to recoup the costs that weren't generated during the pandemic. So instead of saying, look, we've weathered the pandemic, let's just status quo and, and, and bear those losses. There's a CEO out there that's saying, let's jack up the prices so that we can get our money back faster and screw all of those other people who can't afford it even though they could have afforded it prior to the cost increase. So this is about somebody perceiving that the shareholders are just don't care. So again, it's a social issue. This is not a business issue. It's a societal issue. So I'm going to get, I have to keep going. Otherwise I just bog down on a particular topic and I just can't do it. Um, I'd love to be able to talk with people in chat. That would be awesome. Um, okay. So this next article is in the mobile channel. 
uh, on SNL as Saturday Night Live. If you're listening to this and you haven't heard of SNL, um, President Biden seeks help from TikTok influencers. It says the episode hosted by Zoe Kravitz uh, began with uh, Biden briefing a group of creators about the war in Ukraine. If you haven't watched that little um, cold open, then you should watch it. Um, you can find it online. And um, it basically has um, Kate McKinnon, uh, James Austin, Johnson, uh, Bowen Yang um, as Jen. I, I keep hearing it pronounced just Saki. Um, President Biden and a TikTok creator uh, with <laughs> a plunger attached to his nipple. I'll leave it there. But basically, he asked a bunch of uh, these video creators from TikTok about how they can deal with the war in Ukraine um, a as a country. And it, it could have been so much funnier, um, but it basically kind of started out with the possibility and, and just fell flat for me. Um, but I wanted to talk about it because I think that it's great. The, the premise was that there was only one thing left um, to actually reach out to people, and that was TikTok, because everything else is getting shut down um, within Russia. So maybe, you know, pithy uh, short videos that sway somebody uh, works on some population. So I wonder if it would work uh, enough people on TikTok saying, let's shut down this. Ukraine, well, it's not Ukraine's war. It's a Russian war on Ukraine. They need to just back out. But enough of that. The next article is in the word in tech. Ford to ship and sell incomplete vehicles with missing chips. That's the title. Oh, did I say who wrote this article? Um, so the, the one over at uh, New York Times... Uh, about SNL it is written by Dave Itzkoff. And uh, this one over here about Ford, uh, Ford to, to ship and sell incomplete vehicles with missing chips. <laughs> uh, it's like DLC. So here uh, I, I bought a Ford, but I'm waiting for the DLC to drop so that I can actually drive it. Um, Ford will soon start selling and shipping incomplete but drivable vehicles that come without the chips that power certain non-safety features, according to a report from Automa Automotive News. The automaker will instead ship the semiconductors to dealers within one year, uh, which will then install in customers' vehicles after purchase. It's not clear which features will be affected. <laughs> Uh, I'm just astonished. So this article is over at The Verge, and it's written by Emma Roth. Um, vehicles will come without rear heating and air conditioning controls. <laughs> yeah, okay. In the middle of summer, that's going to be awesome. Oh, and then in the middle of winter, because it says within a year. So a year will land us in the same time frame. So everybody will go through a, um, <laughs> a winter without heating um, and without air conditioning controls, without rear heating and air conditioning controls. Surprise, a chip needs to be provided to do rear heating. Um, let's see what's what else is said in this article. The Ford spokesperson said, uh, I, it, wait, is that the name? Ford spokesperson, I guess it's Saeed Deep, um, told The Verge that heating and air conditioning will still be controllable from the front seats and that customers who choose to purchase a vehicle without the rear controls will receive a price reduction. Hey, I'm sure it's in line with, you know, the profitability of the car. According to Deep, Ford is doing this as a way to bring new explorers to customers faster and that the change is only temporary. Um, this brings us back to one of the, I've already done 70 episodes of, uh, hometown daily news, and I've said it in previous ones, 
we need to bring chip production back to the United States. All of this is because it's overseas and all it takes is, is a country pri primarily China um, to just go, Nope, not going to do it. And hobbles the United States uh, it, it, in a spectacular fashion. The conflict right now where Russia is invading Ukraine and the social response of pulling out of Russia allows Russia to nationalize these private assets, these corporate assets, I should say, these corporate assets, nationalize all of them, um, and then dole it out to some uh, oligarch or even shut it down and just take the resources and then um, sell it somewhere else or whatever. I don't even know what the goal is of um, nationalizing um, McDonald's in Russia, but then these companies are going to try to go back to Russia, not even going to work. Uh, you know, they're going to have to pay fealty to Putin if he survives all of this. Um, that said, you know, all of these countries that their, their only motivation really is the economic one. All they have to do is go, well, we've got enough money from you. We'll turn off that spigot and you don't get chips. Then the cost of stuff in the United States is going to go through the roof. Manufacturers are going to have to spin up fabs domestically, have to deal with all of the environmental controls. You know, to me, I think it's abhorrent that they don't have to in other countries. Um, but still, when it comes back to the United States, it's going to drive costs for chips through the roof. Um, because these companies are going to have to recoup again their losses then for the product and they do it faster because people it's going to price out people and other people will spend like early adopters and people with money and will and those without will go into debt and things like that i mean it's it's crazy what people will do um but look at the price for rtx video cards, right? NVIDIA RTX cards. You know, you could buy them from manufacturing for $400, but suddenly they're $1,600 everywhere because somebody with money buys them all up and then sells them. It's all about the money. It's all about greed. And uh, I'm, I've been told, well, it's because you're just bent out of shape because you didn't do it. No, no uh, my moral compass doesn't allow me to take advantage of people. That's the difference. That's the difference. I'm socially conscious. Okay, so this next article is over in the Ban to Bezel channel. This is a, a channel about watches, uh, technology and watches, Apple um but not just smart watches uh, you'll see here in a second um this is about tisset um who or tissot um i think it's just pronounced tisset but has made the strongest push for, of any watch brand of late in breaking through uh, to mainstream watch buyers with its throwback prx line of watches you know the integrated bracelet uh royal oak on a budget pieces that have uh Come hard for the Hamilton Khaki Field Mechanical is the best value in mechanical watches hive. That is a really big sentence. So let's go over to the site. Um, this is a, an article over at Hodinkee. And um, it's written by Danny Milton. They always have fabulous artwork um, or photographs, whatever. It's usually a photograph of a watch, but this is like spectacular photography. I don't know if they do it or if somebody else does it and provides it, but, um, let me check something really quick. Okay. Oh, I can't. Oh, I can't say it. Okay. Well, anyway, um, yeah, I thought so. I think it's just pronounced to so, but okay. Anyway, um, this is a, a new watch, um, a new look to the brand's popular collection. And so you should go over to the Hodinkee, um, site and check it out. They always have fabulous photography. Um, they really represent the watch that they are talking about really well. And then they give just 
a, a massive amount of detail about it, right? The 42 millimeter chrono comes in two dial options, blue and silver with rose gold plated hands and, pa and a panda effect via the contrast of black sub dials uh, against the silver background. They had a typo in their sentence. The dial features a 30 minute and 12 hour totalizer. Uh, each of the two variants utilize a controversial 430 date window as well as the PRX word mark down near six o'clock. So let's see here. How much does this little beast cost? So $5,000 watches. Wait, wait. Now, while I typically don't love exhibition case backs on sub $5,000 watches, I think the Valjou, I think that's how it's pronounced, Valjou, um, A05H31 is very well showcased here. Wow, he's got a limit as when an exhibition case back uh, will be displayed. That's fascinating. Anyway, um, these exhibition case backs, I call them skeletonized uh, case backs, um, show the inner workings of the uh, watch. Um, but it's underneath, um, so you don't really get to see it at all until you take it off and flip it over. Um, I suppose, you know, the, the joke about how do you know someone's an attorney? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, or... How do you know somebody has a Subaru? Don't worry, they'll tell you that kind of thing. Well, how do you know somebody has a Rolex or a Tissot? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Anyway, um, let's see. I'm trying to get to the price. So the pricing is $1,750, which for some of the most of the stuff that's displayed on this site is actually a reasonable price. Um, they all this is a luxury watch kind of a uh, site. Um, sorry for the fast scroll again, but go over to Hodinki and you'll be able to check it out. Of course, you can always follow the links. The links are always there, except for the 11th. Um, I broke something and lost my links. Anyway, um, the next article is over in the continuity report. And it's Tom Holland's Uncharted is banned in Vietnam over illegal map images. Uh, Sony's hit action adventure Uncharted has been banned in Vietnam over the film's inclusion of a map that depicts China's contested territorial claims in Southeast Asia, the film which stars Tom Holland, Mark Wahlberg, and Antonio Banderas, uh, was to arrive in Vietnamese cinemas uh, from March 18th, uh, but apparently uh, was hobbled. Again, nothing says freedom like oppressing a movie my gosh because of a map this article is over at variety.com uh, it's written by patrick freighter and uh, has a picture about uh, from um, uncharted and the prior it says prior to this weekend the film had grossed 278 million according to box office mojo um, so it looks like it would be a fun watch. Um, I can't get past Mark Wahlberg as a professor telling us that trees are going to kill us all. <coughs> Pardon me. But um, even in this, you know, it's it's basically one of those adventure movies. And I'm sure it's a good watch. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I wait so that I can just buy it and, and watch it in the, the home theater. And... Um, I will end up watching it. It says, uh, let's see. Right? Where? Hmm. Okay. Let's see. I'm scrolling to see if I can find something. Uh, the following year, Vietnam ordered DreamWorks animated film Abominable to be pulled from cinemas 10 days into its release after reviewers brought a 9 dash line map to the attention of authorities local distributor cgv was subsequently fined also in 2020 um series put your head on my shoulder and madam secretary were edited to remove similar map images and last year netflix was forced to remove 
some episodes of Australian espionage series Pine Gap, even though the on-screen dialogue described China's claim as disputed. Well, let's see. There's a phrase. What is it? Um, yeah, I'll have to. I, I, I don't remember it accurately right now, but it's basically if you're in charge of. Yeah, if you, something along the lines of if you're in charge, then you set the future. And if you set the future, um, you can change the past. And if you change the past, you basically control the future in this kind of, and I think I'm just kind of m m merging the sentiment together, um, a, a little bit too muddy, but basically it comes down to if you're in control of a country, you can decide the history by deleting all of the factual evidence so that you retain whatever perceived provenance exists so that you can stay in power. And that's kind of just how, uh, you know, uh, how it is again, society is abused when everything is in the dark, you shut off the internet, you shut off communication, you manipulate the historical record, etc., etc., And you end up with abusive regimes. Let me keep going again. I'll end up bogged down. And I'm not quite sure how to remedy this because I, I say it again and again. Um, but here, let me scroll this over a little bit. Um, I, I kind of say this again and again that I, I'm getting bogged down in the, the article that I'm talking about. And uh, it, it really is. That's, that's really what happens. And I don't know how to just not say that because I feel like if I ignore it, then I just keep on talking about it. Um, people might think that, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know what people are thinking. Uh, I haven't heard anybody say anything there. There aren't any reviews. Uh, nobody has really said anything in chat. Um, although uh, I've been told that this is kind of a cool premise. Um, I hope that you all are enjoying it. I would love to hear from people. Um, just let me know. Um, this next article is over in the word in tech. And the Mac Studio is myth fulfillment. In 2008, Macworld devoted five pages to the kind of mid-tower Mac that Apple refused to make. Uh, the myth of XMac, the mid-range Mac tower that never was. This is an article over at The Verge. It's written by Jason, Jason Snell. This is, I would say, go over to The Verge and read this article from end to end if you are interested in Mac and Apple history. It says the myth of XMac, the mid-range Mac that never was. Um, and it shows Franken-Mac versus Mac Pro. And uh, the Clone Wars. And I was, I was around during these times um, <laughs> without aging myself too much. I was well involved in tech prior to 2008, but, um, the, the idea of, pardon me, let me just scroll back up. Um, Mac clones came into existence and then just flamed out. Um, there was a, a maker of Mac clones and they basically were, lost their license to make it anymore that died the mac pro has been um, just a beast of a machine for most people um, but this this article is is talking to a uh, talking to you about a, a product that says back in the 90s and early 2000s mac uh, being a mac nerd meant using a power mac the arrival of the original iMac in 1998 was greeted with enthusiasm by Mac nerds. Uh, there are people that everybody, well, I should say Mac users, Apple ecosystem people are very devoted to that, to, to Apple, to the product line. So 
Let's see. Let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Um, sorry for the for the quiet. I'm trying to scan this article. I remember all of these products, Power PC. Um, my first interaction with a Mac was a Mac Two, and uh, I think I was in fifth grade, something like that. <laughs> So what is an ex-Mac fan to do? A lot of them tried building Hackintoshes, custom Intel PCs that used Apple compatible parts onto which Mac OS could be installed. In 2008, a company named Cystar tried to sell Mac OS compatible mini towers directly to consumers only to be sued into oblivion by Apple. Um, there actually was a company that was licensed um, at one point, but um, it was pre 2000. Um, but yeah, you couldn't get a legitimate license for Mac OS, um, for use on anything other than Mac hardware. So, um, the moment that a Hackintosh came into existence, basically they would be crushed. Um, and then they talk about the Mac pro trash can, which could be destroyed by throwing, uh, setting a book on top of it. It would overheat. Um, yeah, th this is kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to scroll up real fast. I'm really sorry, but the Mac studio is just a beast of a machine with the M one ultra. I can't wait for the next generation of it, which is probably when I'll be getting a, a, a Mac studio. Um, I always, well, sometimes I'm an early, early, early adopter, um, but for this, I think that I'll wait and, and see what uh, comes with the next generation, but it could be 10 years from now. So maybe I'll um, bite the bullet anyway and, and get a Mac studio um, only because it affords me the ability to use a ton of RAM and a ton of storage and, and quite a bit of speed so that I can uh, do everything that I do. Um, cause I don't always just stream an hour a day and nothing else. Um, that said, go over to, um, the verge and read this article. The next article is again about the Mac pro, um, Apple Silicon Mac pro could combine two M one ultra chips for speed. The Apple Silicon Mac pro may follow the lead of the Mac studios M one ultra a rumor claims by effectively combining two M one ultra chips into a single 40 core system on a chip. Click this link and just take you over there. Um, this is an article from appleinsider.com written by Malcolm Owen. Uh, go over to Apple Insider and, and read this article and um, come back and talk to me about it. Or if you have an idea about this now, feel free to throw something into chat. Uh, the idea of this connecting to M1 Ultras kind of defies what the design of the M1 Ultra really is right now. Um, it's almost impossible unless they do something else in their design. Um, they will not be able to tie two M1 Ultra chips together because what it is, is uh, an M1 Ultra is two M1 Max chips um, because there's basically a, a future-proof end to the ultra or sorry um to the max and then they've fused the two together it's been there since its initial production um and nobody really paid attention to it apparently i didn't know about it but i wasn't paying attention to it to begin with um but then they fused the two chips together because it has a backplane literally it's like a backplane an io port so that the two chips could be connected in their manufacturing process um, and literally that's what an M1 Ultra is, but putting two of them together, it would have to change the entire architecture, um, again, which is no inexpensive feat. So I'm going to have to hurry to get all of this in, um, the next article, um, is, uh, the daily news show, how to buy a vacant lot. Buying land is one way to get your dream house, but the rules uh, can be much tougher and you might have to source your own electricity. 
this is an article just so that you know that you can um, look into this on your own. Buying land is one way to get your dream house, right? But you have to buy everything else. If you are interested in um, getting a, a custom house or semi-custom house built, um, it is no easy feat. Even if you find a good location, you'll have to get power and water and all of the well, utilities, the road, everything is on your dime. Um, whereas when you move into a community that's already pre-built, there's a lot of things that are already accounted for across the, the density of the development. And so you're not putting out uh, a lot of money for getting things like septic installed or uh, extending um, city sewer and water to your place. Um, but either way, you'll have to get electricity and city, um, either septic or uh, water lines brought in, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's just not, not an easy thing to do, but this article ends up talking to you about it. And uh, that's why I kind of, that's why I linked to it. And that's why I introduced it to you. Um, it says here, frustrated with the lack of homes for sale, the Popats, uh, which I guess is the, the uh, two people that are being referenced here, Vicky and Mickey Popat, um, who have two children decided to look for a price uh, for a piece of land where they could build their, wow, nine bedroom dream home with lots of spaces for offices and guest rooms. After several months of searching, the couple bought a one and a half acre acre lot on a cul-de-sac in July, paying the full list price of four hundred thousand dollars. And that right there is not the Popats. Um, but yeah, you'll have to get a contractor and you'll have to do surveying and all kinds of stuff. Um, it is not going to be cheap. So, but you can buy the land. And uh, the land will probably go up in value. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole article um, here live, but uh, I've gone through this process and um, it's not for everybody. Um, so let's continue on. Let's get these last few articles out of the way and uh, we can uh, call it a night. The, um, the next article is in the Daily News Show. And... Uh, Russia asked China for military and economic aid for Ukraine war, Biden officials say. Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor, plans to meet with top Chinese official on Monday in Rome to discuss the war and China's role. Um, this is not an inexpensive, um, not just financially, but socially, and the lives of soldiers who... For all intents, based on some of the radio intercepts that I've heard and other um, publications that are reporting, um, there are um, a lot of lives being lost. Um, and I'm not even talking about Ukraine. Um, the ones that, in, that are lost in Ukraine, the, the, the citizens of Ukraine, uh, it's unspeakable. Um, and there, there isn't much that I can say other than it shouldn't be going on. Um, well, it's not really, this was supposed to be for all, uh, intents. This is supposed to be only a, a two week action supposedly. Well, it's going to run way longer than that unless somebody capitulates. And so this article is over at the New York Times. It's written by Edward Wong and Julian E. Barnes. And uh, apparently uh, Putin asked China for support. And uh, my perspective is I hope it's not provided. So this all shuts down um, because the campa that campaign is just deplorable. It says, Mr. Sullivan intends to warn Mr. Yang about the future Chinese efforts to bolster Russia in its war or undercut Ukraine, the United States, and their partners. Um, yeah, this is the kind of interaction where uh, Putin is saying nobody else tamper with things, but then he's reaching out to Syrian fighters, um, Belarusian fighters, now China. Um, rather unspeakable so 
This next article is in the continuity report about the uh, Umbrella Academy season three. If you've never seen the Umbrella Academy, you should go and check it out. Um, basically, it's people that are kind of like they have superpowers of sorts. <laughs> um, they're they're interesting superpowers, superpowers that I've never seen before in the, you know in terms of superpowers. But it says the uh, Umbrella Academy Season 3 teaser reveals showdown with the Sparrow Academy June in the June release date. So uh, the Umbrella Academy will return on June 22nd to Netflix. Um, and it was um, introduced by the showrunner uh, Steve Blackman at South by Southwest on Sunday. That's today. Netflix also dropped first look images of the cast and a season three trailer, and you'll be able to find that on YouTube. Um, and I can't really go into great detail. Um, pretty much talking about this in any way ruins a lot of the um, discussion or the surprise, I should say. This article is written uh, by Sasha Urban over at Variety. And um, you'll dig this show. Uh, it's it's not. It, it's very interesting in that you, it's a convoluted storyline, with a lot of personal development. The the characters are developed. The world uh, building is pretty interesting, um, even if it doesn't really show a lot of world building. Um, it's an interesting and complex story that um, revolves around itself. <laughs> Um, so I don't know what the end game of this uh, season is going to be. And I really don't want to talk too much about it. I'm just going to tease you into going and watching the Umbrella Academy. And then maybe, you know, we can uh, talk about it in the continuity report when I uh, eventually spin it up. Um, and then we're going to end with one more thing. It might be politically charged if you think about it, but this is actually my perception of this and my context for the discussion my little bit of context to this is that this is a social thing it has nothing to do with politics just zero to do with politics zero um this is in the mobile channel and it's the title of this article that was aggregated is in whitner uh sorry in whip oh my gosh in whitmer kidnapping trial lawyers debate over defendants words and it says the proceedings that began last week test the government's ability to root out violent extremism at home. So you click the link and uh, it's a New York Times article and uh, it's written by Francis Robles. And it says few people took the COVID lockdown uh, restrictions that swept the world in the spring of 2020 harder than far right extremist Adam Fox. Not even talking about politics. This is a sociological concern. Basically, Fox and three militia members conspired to abduct um, Whitmer. And one of the things that was quoted in the article and said in court was, we want her flex cuffed on a table. So they wanted to abduct her. Um, and this was all planned, all discussed. Um, they were ready to act and it was caught, right? So it was stopped because there were insiders. Um, and they're arguing, it says here, um, Junker put a spotlight on an overreaching government willing to manufacture plots to criminalize free speech and crack down on the government's perceived enemies. Although Judge Junker had initially ruled that he would limit the use of an entrapment defense, he changed course after opening statements. You know, the context of this trial means quite a bit. So um, I'll end up having to look more into this simply because of um, I want to know uh, what really went down in this and if somebody was kind of led along, kind of like leading a witness, right? You ask questions or you make statements, something like what happened with Facebook. If you feed enough people negative stuff, they end up responding negatively outside of the influence, right? 
This is a real event that took place. Facebook manipulated the news feeds of 700,000 people. I reach back in time for this because it still happens. We are manipulated with news and I'm not referring to, you know, fake news or whatever it is. We are manipulated with news where I'm reporting what others are reporting. I give my particular context to it, my historical reference to it. Um, and, and in this particular case, it's about a societal issue. These people, if everything is said and done and they actually made these statements and were about to do these actions, this was their response to a problem that killed close to a million people in the United States, right? We're over 800,000. I haven't looked in, in a couple of weeks now at the number of people that have died, but it's somewhere in between like North Carolina and South Carolina in the, in terms of population, I think I'd have to, I, I don't remember um, the last time that I looked, but we're talking about an entire state's worth of population gone more than Wyoming um, by a far stretch in terms of what COVID did. And somebody thought that abducting a human being was the answer to it. We as a society have a problem and it's definitely not COVID. We can get all of that under control, but it takes a society to move in unison to resolve it, right? This, this virus could have been stamped out a whole lot sooner, but for lack of the population basically saying, yeah, okay, we'll solve the problem out of conspiracy theory. And to me, lack of education. So that's why I talk about that. This has nothing to do with politics. It, it's a societal issue, not a political one. Um, so, and that's where I'm ending. It's not a high note. Uh, you know, I can't always leave on a high note. I thought I'd be able to say something witty and, and kind of disarm this, but it is what it is. One of the quotes from this for crying out loud is they're looking forward to the civil war. Jonathan Roth, an assistant U S attorney said they're getting ready for it and they're looking for ways to start it. You know, was, is that an inflammatory statement or is it a truthful statement based on the context of information that's provided to him? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see at the end of this. I'm sure that there's going to be some great discussion. And by great, I mean a lot of it. Well, with that in mind, I think I'm going to have to end the stream. But again, if you go to hometown.com and you click on that front page, it should refresh and give you a whole new set of news articles, headlines from around the web. And then tomorrow we'll talk about the last 24 hours worth of news. Sound good. I'll see you here tomorrow at 6 PM. Don't forget your clocks moved forward an hour in the United States. I don't know where everybody, what everybody else does, but there are calendars that actually have 0.25 of a day so that you don't have leap year. And if we just get rid of daylight savings time, we could all be on the same clock, you know, it's weird. Why leap forward and fall back? We all have to get up at the same time anyway, day or night, doesn't matter. Anyway, gone are those days. Okay. <laughs>